Number 10, the Smello Vision. Oh, this is bad. We've come a long way since the dawn of filmmaking. Imagine all of your movies costing five cents and all in black and white with no sound. Ooh, what a time to be alive. Today, obviously, we have color, sound, virtual reality, and those moving boxes of the movies, which honestly, I'm not crazy about. I they shake too much, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. Same with the 3D, those, those glasses that we used to wear, we don't really do the 3D anymore, it was bad. Anyway, some people think that's not enough. Some people want more. Enter the smell vision created by a man named Hans Lüb. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that just writes itself, doesn't it? The idea is that while you are watching a movie, you can smell the smells on screen. A field of grass, a car chase with burning rubber, a breakfast scene. Mm. My issue is what happens if I leave the smell vision on and and I fall asleep on the couch and reruns of Dirty Jobs comes on. Ooh, yucky. Or better yet, you guys have a smell of vision and you're watching my bloopers. Uh oh, stinky. That wouldn't be very good, would it? Number nine, the Virtual Boy. This one's just crazy. I doubt many people would remember this, and in Nintendo's defense, they usually know what they're doing. Well, most of the time. Usually. There's so many remasters that they could do. It's a license to print money. I don't know why they don't. Come on, Nintendo, I'm waiting for it. The Virtual Boy, however, oh boy. I wouldn't expect many to have seen it since the sales were poor. The Virtual Boy was a 32 bit portable console that was basically a headset, except, you know, there's no straps to put it around your head, but a stand so you can play games on it while laying prone? Yeah, I'm not sure. My back hurts just looking at it. Just doesn't make a lot of sense. The main selling point was the graphics. It was a big topic back in the 90s. The Virtual Boy was capable of 3D, which was huge for the time, way ahead of its time. Except it was stereographic 3D and monochrome red. Everything was just shades of red. So watching footage of the gameplay gives me a headache as I'm sure playing it would. So I can see why laying on your living room floor playing this, well, it sucks. Number eight, the black powder mousetrap, mice. They're everywhere and they suck. At least the wild ones. Some people got cute pets. So we place mouse traps to get rid of them. However, sometimes we get our fingers cut, which also sucks. Oh man, it hurts really bad. Or if you're a friend of Johnny Knoxville, it hurts all over. They, they do a lot of weird stuff with mouse traps. Love those guys. However, one design of mouse trap I think is the worst because it could potentially end your life is the black powder mouse trap. It was essentially just like ye olde cannons of the time. Black powder, big iron ball, except just on a much tinier scale and in the house because you know, having a cannon go off in the house is a great idea. Sure, let's just have that. That, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Number seven, back to the future. During the technological boom of electronics in the 1980s, there was one invention I think is really unusual. Computers, camcorders, and even home video game consoles were becoming commonplace all over the world. People who are familiar with retro Nintendo consoles are familiar with the likes of Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, or Contra. You may even remember a certain gaming accessory involving a laughing dog every time you miss a duck. What 80s kids might not remember is the Konami Laser Scope. Similar to Nintendo Zapper, but with two key differences. One, it's a headset instead of a pistol. Two, it's voice controlled, meaning when you come across enemies in game, you have to shout fire to fire in game. The Konami laser scope was bold and tried to be ahead of its time, but when taking a good look at it, one, it makes the user just look ridiculous, and two, it doesn't work. Reviews for the headset are not favorable and just defeat the purpose of using a headset. Today we have VR headsets that may seem just as ridiculous, but they work, and the use of voice still isn't a primary control used in games today. Number six, Battleship Woodchip. This is one of my favorites. Okay, hear me out for this one. Back in the 1940s, there was a really super, not very fun, expensive war happening. Germany, Japan, and Italy needed to go into the timeout corner. But after a while of people trying to put each other in the timeout corner, things were getting super expensive. World War II was fought on all fronts, land, sea, and air. The sea being a key part of the war victory in the beginning of the war. Literally tons of war goods and ships were being sunk by German U-boats every day across the Atlantic. So in order to cut costs, what if the ships were built out of something cheaper, but just as tough as steel? Concrete, right? Nope, I bet you weren't thinking ice. Or more specifically, sawdust and ice mixed to form piecrete. Testing with Pycrete had gone so well that in a super secret general meeting, Pycrete was presented, shot at in the meeting, ricocheting a bullet causing another general a flesh wound. Having its defense capabilities proven in the war room, Operation Habakkuk was greenlit and the Allies were planning on constructing an aircraft carrier made out of ice and sawdust to help thwart the German U-boats. 
However, this was scrapped, as a boat made of sawdust and ice would really not be much help against a German U-boat. Plus, where do you sleep? Can you cook on there? Way more questions than answers. Number 5. Hello there! Channeling our inner General Grievous, our number 5 spot belongs to the monowheel. Originally designed in the 19th century, it wasn't until the 20th century they slapped a motor on one of these bad boys and did their best escape attempt from Utapau. Sorry, I'm a Star Wars guy. It just looks like the vehicle from the third movie, I can't help myself. In reality, the monocycle is a single wheeled motorized vehicle where the driver either sits inside the wheel housing or right beside it. Today these vehicles are still around but really only used for entertainment purposes, as the design does have a few issues. One wheel gives balance issues, there's a visibility issue since, well, you know, you're usually sitting inside the wheel, and an issue called gerbling, which basically means if the driver brakes too hard, the inner ring will overcome its own gravity and the driver will do a full loop, similar to how a gerbil spins around on its wheel. Seeing that would make Monday morning traffic a lot more amusing though, I gotta say. Number 4. Deep breath my equine friend. World War 1 was the war to end all wars, except for the 10 major wars that came after it. Noted for being the bloodiest and most destructive conflict at the time, it gave humanity a bunch of cool and exciting inventions, so long as they were not being used on you. One of the worst things to come out of the First World War was the extensive use of trench warfare and chemical weapons, or more specifically chlorine gas. Trench warfare was brutal, not only in its barbaric over the top charges into machine gun fire, but also in its living. Trenches had terrible living conditions, and were difficult to take from the enemy. Crossing no man's land was no joke. So to eliminate the pesky enemies entrenched in their trenches, the very cruel chlorine gas was used, causing nausea, violent coughing, chest pain, and corneal burns, just about everything you'd find on the back of normal medication, right? Gas masks helped when they were available, but unfortunately they were not the only living creatures on the battlefield. This is where our invention comes in. The very depressing invention of the horse gas mask. The idea is the same. Horses need protection too, and since World War I was still a war powered by horses, it was more common than you might think. And a lot of our equine friends perished alongside us. Number 3. Flying Car Maybe it's because we love the idea of breaking new ground, setting precedents, or we really just want to live with the Jetsons. It was a cool cartoon. The Mizar Flying Car was designed by a group of engineers in the early 1970s, using the very famous Ford Pinto like previously mentioned, because, well, it sucks on the ground so it's got to be good in the sky, right? Right? That makes sense. Well, no. Besides the mechanical issues, it would be a hard sell as, well, you know, the average American doesn't have flying experience, or not to mention a runway in their backyard. Plus, we have trouble with drones today. Imagine if it was raining Ford Pintos. Yikes. Mom, there's another Ford Pinto in the living room! It wouldn't, it wouldn't go very well, would it? No. Number two, the pet rock. This one's so stupid. It's just a rock. Legit, that's all it is. I thought about buying a rock and naming it. Oftentimes, including those little googly eyes to make you believe it's alive because yeah, okay. It's a ridiculous invention, it has no use. However, what it actually is, is a lesson in great marketing. Something weird enough that can be marketed quite easily, sold at an affordable price, and something that is already familiar with the people everywhere. So it actually makes sense, even if it is a bad invention. And number one, uh, this one, it's just so true, the Segway. About 15 years ago, these bad boys were all the rage. Basically, it's an electric scooter on two wheels with a handle to lean forward and lean back, or perhaps reverse. While there was some success in malls and airports, there wasn't that many in public. The main reason? Well, it's no different than a scooter or a bike, really, and uh, well, it kind of feels like an attempt to reinvent the wheel when we don't need it. Also, in 2022, how many people do you know that have a Segway? Seriously. And if someone pulled up in a Segway to your hangout? It'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would be weird. Number 10. The National Razor. What's a revolution without a little blood being spilt? Wouldn't really be a revolution, would it? France was having a hard time in the 1700s, so they needed a brand new way to get rid of pesky monarchs and anyone who isn't warming up to the revolutionary ideals. And what better way to keep people warm by cleaving their heads from their body? A man named Joseph Ignace Guillotine suggested that there was a better method for unaliving those who needed to be unalived. It got common misconception is that he invented the guillotine, but rather suggested its implementation, where his name would become synonymous with such a terrible device. Basically, you got a wood frame with a hole for your noggin and a large angled blade. Blade drops down from frame and removes the head of state from the governing body. Which isn't just a clever joke, as that's what happened to the last king and queen of France. 
By the time of its invention and the end of its use all the way up into the 1970s, yes, that's right, it was used up until the 70s, thousands of people met their doom to the National Razor. Number 9. Party Favors in the Sky When you think of air travel today, you think of lots of space for you and your fellow passengers, meals that are flavorful and affordable. Air travel in 2021 is a stress-free, very organized way to travel. But in the 1700s, these luxuries of the sky were non-existent, as there was no air travel. Any international travel was done by ship, which took months at a time and was not a pleasurable experience, opposite to what was described above. Two French brothers wanted to change this, or rather just get off the ground. The two French brothers, Montegolfier, developed and flew the first unmanned hot air balloon on September 19, 1783. This was shortly followed up with a manned flight by Jean-Francois Pilate de Rosier. This was a very strange invention at the time, as this was really the beginning of humans and flight. Number 8. Puckle needs his gat. Ever since black powder first made it to Europe and Europeans figured out you could make big gun that go boom, people have been trying to come up with better and faster ways to make gun go boom. In the 1700s, the biggest issue with muskets and cannons at the time was reloading or getting multiple shots off. Loading black powder weapons isn't easy. I'd say ask a pirate, but you can't. Those, those kind of pirates are all, all gone now. So to fix the issue of the day, a man named James Puckle invented the very cleverly named Puckle Gun. Basically, he just added more chambers of shot rotating around one barrel. Although his idea for the time was genius, in practice it wasn't very effective, as flintlock and black powder are really the main issue. Clumsy, lots of smoke, and does not want to work in less than fair weather conditions. Number 7. The Baby Cage Living in large cities can be difficult. Toronto, being the third largest in North America, well, I can relate. It's crazy we're that big. Things get busy even in the suburbs here. There's a hustle and a bustle that small cities and towns just don't get. Now, back in the early 20th century, this was still the case, except there wasn't the same emphasis on park life, biking, and enjoying what fresh air actually is in the city like there is in modern cities today. We've done better since then. And there's nothing more important than fresh air for babies. So that's why in the 1920s, the baby cage was invented. Basically, it was a wire cage that hangs out of your fifth floor apartment window, like that massive AC unit that hasn't worked properly since McDonald's ran out of Szechuan sauce. Obviously, I don't need to tell you why this is a bad idea, and not too long after, it was outlawed. It's just don't, don't, that's high up, it could drop, yeah, no, bad idea, not a good idea. Number six, this one's for the older crowd, the Ford Pinto. Remember those bad boys? I never had the pleasure of being in one or owning one myself, but I swear to God, every time my family got together, the men would sit around and talk about about cars that they own. It's kind of a man thing to do, I guess. Even though they all had the same conversation the last time, which is just like only a couple months ago. And one model that always comes up is the Ford Pinto. Today, cars get recalled all the time, but in the age of affordable family vehicles and quality, the Ford Pinto stood out, especially because there was a chance the Pinto could burst into flames, which is arguably the worst thing a car could do. Besides not work, I, I'd argue not working is better than bursting into flames. A few other major issues really set back what I think is a very sleek and appealing vehicle to both mom and dad and the family. Number five, the spaghetti fork. Make sure you put my special spaghetti fork on the table. I need to eat my pasta and gabagool. Italians and lovers of the best cuisine on earth, in my opinion, I love Italian cuisine, get ready to cringe. The twirling spaghetti fork is a battery operated fork that twirls when you push a button, so you no longer suffer the burden of twirling your own spaghetti. Listen, I'm a big dude, I'm lazy, I love staying in after a long week of work and playing video games, probably my favorite thing to do. Yeah, sometimes I order in because I don't feel like getting up, but not twirling mom's spaghetti? Come on, twirling the spaghetti, that, I argue that's the best part. No dinner with no no should require double A batteries in my opinion, I'm just saying. Hey, you bring a fork, why you bring us a fork? Number four, hydrogen blimps. It really must have been something to witness humans gaining flight. Something so previously impossible was now not only possible, but something that you had to pay money for, which is how you know it was very successful. Large jumbo jets full of croc wearing tours headed to slob attractions was still a thing of the future. We're not there yet. This is still the early 1900s, we'll get there. So how do we get people to places in large numbers and still manage to be opulent, said a bunch of people in the early 1900s. Airships, said Germany, who took the blimp game to the next level. However, a lot of these blimps made a cut in their design, if you will. To help save on money, the airships were filled with the much more cheaper hydrogen, which in large quantities is extremely volatile. The Hindenburg is a great example. Well, we could fill it with a safe fuel, 
Uh, but it's really expensive, but we could fill it with the fuel that could destroy the whole thing, and that's like 10 times cheaper. Well, I'll fill it with that then, why would you not? Number three, pseudo cool. Okay, so back in the 1700s, food was really hard to keep. For example, meat is packed with a salty brine in order to preserve it. It either has to be shipped overseas or last long enough through a cold and brutal winter. But plans for refrigeration were being drawn up, specifically the idea of vapor compression refrigeration. Not exactly the fridge that's in your kitchen today, considering there's you know, still no main harnessing of electricity, which makes fridges run, but a brilliant idea nonetheless. While the fridge we know was still far away, it's crazy to think in the 1700s we had serious plans for one. While this was being developed, food was kept near lakes and snows in the winter. Runoffs from mountains were often used to keep drinks cool. I think this is something we all take for granted. I mean, can you imagine drinking room temperature milk or having a beef dinner that tastes saltier than salt? Looking back through history, it's interesting to see how humans persevere. As much as I love food, I don't know if I could stomach food from the past. Thank goodness we don't eat anything gross today. Hey man, uh, do you have any canned cheese left? I'm kind of hungry. Number two, ebony, ivory, living together in harmony. I honestly thought this one was older than the 1700s, but hey, here we are, invented in the year 1700 by a musically inclined Italian gentleman named Bartolomeo Cristofori. Unhappy with what was going on at the time, he decided to spice it up by changing out a few parts of some common instruments and started using little hammers that strike quickly on chords and come back in hopes they would not dampen the sound. A little fine tuning here and there and bada bing bada boom, you got a piano. I would attempt to make a joke about the piano, but let's be honest, no piano, no Elton John. No jazz, no Frank Sinatra. If you're asking me, that's a big problem. Number one, ABCs. As someone who struggles with reading, this one makes me want to hide under my covers at night. I spent countless hours as a kid learning to read and oh, Man, the phonics lessons were brutal. And thanks to this invention, I can blame it all on the 1755 invention, the English Dictionary. Yep, that's right. One of the most influential too. Written by Samuel Johnson, it took seven years to compile all the words I can't pronounce. He was commissioned 1,500 guineas for the project, which is worth about 250,000 pounds today. Until the completion of the Oxford Dictionary 173 years later, Johnson's Dictionary is considered to be the preeminent English dictionary and a huge achievement in scholarship. I mean, you gotta give the guy credit for writing this. Imagine writing an English essay for seven years. But then again, 250,000 pounds for some of my writing also sounds pretty good. All I have to do now is learn to read and write. Number 10. Tea. I honestly don't think I could make it through the day without a cup of tea in the morning. The Britain me just can't do it. But I owe this to China. Specifically, I owe this to Chinese Emperor Shenong from way back in 2737 BC. Now listen to this story. Once upon a time, Emperor Shenong liked to drink hot water. One day, while out on a march with his army, they stopped to rest and catch their breath. At the camp, a servant was preparing Shenong's hot water when a leaf from a tree fell and landed in the water, turning it brown. Instead of discarding the new liquid, it was presented to the emperor, who drank and found it refreshing. Boom! Tea. While used as medicine before this, in the Tang Dynasty, it really became a common beverage enjoyed by many. This time period from 616 to 908 AD also saw the Book of Tea, written by Lu Yu, which contained ways to cultivate tea, tea drinking, and different classifications of tea in details. Thanks, Lu Yu. You the best. Number nine, compass. A vast sea all drunken sailors and maybe Jack Sparrow, depending on how long the trial lasts. We'll see how it goes. The invention of the compass hails from the ancient land to the east. I learned again today. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. Way back in the Han Dynasty, the first use of the compass was accomplished with a lodestone. For those who forgot what that was from their grade 4 museum field trip, tisk tisk, it will be on the test later, as well as some vocabulary in English. A lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet and aligns itself with the magnetic field, brother. While only used for land at first, it wasn't long before it made its way onto a boat, where it speculated it was traded off into the Islamic world and eventually the west. My only experience with the compass was in Minecraft, and it doesn't point north, it points to spawn. Boy, did I learn the hard way. Number eight, movable type printing. Fun fact, the first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. While the printing press would come much later in Europe, the idea of being able to print identical copies without handwriting began 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty. 
You see, before this point, if you wanted to pass on the good word of your religion, or teach somebody something, or tell somebody about the past, or give secret little I love you notes to each other, you had to either do it by word of mouth or handwriting. <coughs> Gross. Then, in the previously mentioned Han Dynasty, people began stone tablet rubbing, which evolved into carving words and pictures onto a stone board, lathering that bad boy up with ink and pressing it onto paper. And boom, that's printing. But then, in 1041 to 1048, a guy named Bai Sheng carved characters on identical pieces of clay which he hardened by baking, resulting in pieces of movable type that could be stored and used again later. And now we have printers! Innovation, am I right? Number 7. Cotton Eye Joe Dear YouTube Gods, I am sorry that history is full of not so cool things, but here at Bumblebee, I'm the Queen Bee, and I'm here to give the buzz to my sweet honeybees. So in the name of good morals, monetization, and not getting smited, I'm going to talk about your least favorite S word. Back in the 1700s, America was chillin'. They just beat Britain in a war, which alone could be its own video. They were starting to build their own country, particularly in these southern colonies using forced unpaid labor that you can't leave. Oh, and your boss can do heinous things to you because uh, he owns you. Their economy was agricultural based and stayed that way for a long time. Tobacco being the number one crop at first, cotton was still grown but wasn't as popular due to the processing of cotton being a very labor intensive and difficult process. This was until Eli Whitney's cotton gin vented in 1794. The cotton gin was a machine that quickly removed seeds and processed cotton, making cotton a very valuable crop since, you know, the people harvesting the cotton are YouTube's least favorite S word. It's a, it's a brutal unpaid workforce. Now that it was profitable, cotton boomed and the South became very wealthy. While not exactly the main reason, the South getting rich off Whitney's design and did somewhat create a divide between the southern states and the northern states, eventually leading to the Civil War. Also, apparently plantation owners didn't pay Eli for his machine and he went broke. Just trashy behavior all around, man. Come on. Number 6. Yes, I'm a Russian submarine commander. I actually couldn't believe this one myself, but the submarine was invented in the 1700s. Having designs and plans started in the 1500s, the first real use of a submersible vessel wasn't until 1775, named the Turtle, an acorn-shaped vessel with a crew of just one. To me, it's just hard to think that in the same century we were beginning to master flight and sea travel. I also can't stop thinking that if there was a water ride that existed, it would be pretty cool if you went underwater in like a pod, like a submarine kind of thing. Just an idea for the mouse and the corporation. Of course, it wouldn't be years until after the Turtle that the submarine would see effective use. Or have a Scottish man play a Russian submarine commander in a really good movie. Russian submarine commander. Number 5. Dawn of the Punch Guard With the Industrial Revolution on the horizon, many things were about to change. Probably the most obvious at the time was factories. While not the first, Richard Arkwright's Cromford Mill in 1771 is what most resembles a modern factory today. Cromford Mill was the first water powered cotton spinning mill and initially employed 200 workers. It ran day and night with two 12 hour work shifts, the gates being locked at 6 am and 6 pm, permitting no late arrivals. Oh, he likes to keep a tight schedule. Yeah, I can see the beginnings of a modern factory, all right. All you're missing is Bezos and a couple of drones to make it modern. All jokes aside, though, uh, these early factories changed the very fabric of not only Britain, but also the world. I mean, where would we be today with all that lovely pollution and those great and fair working conditions? I, I, I bet there was benefits, too. Number 4. The Golden Liquid You drink liquid, and then it's gonna come out of you. It's simple. It's science. But sometimes other fluids need to be drained. Sometimes you can have difficulty using the little boys room. Personally, I'm still learning how to put down the toilet seat. I haven't quite figured that one out. How to make pee when a person cannot pee. Portly founding father Benjamin Franklin thought to himself as he was holding a kite in the rain. This is something I learned, which I didn't know, is that he invented the flexible catheter. Yep. Next time you feel a little weird because a tube is being inserted into a sensitive area, you can thank the man on the $100 bill. Invented in 1752 in order to aid his brother with bladder stones. It's strange though, you know, you think of a guy inventing other things, but in reality, it's a really important invention and something that's very common in the medical world today. I just hope to stay healthy long enough so no tube has to go near my founding father. Number 3. Earthquake Detector Earthquakes are a big problem. It's an issue in California as they're still waiting for the big one. It's a problem in Pokemon. When the gym leader I thought was going to be easy surprised me with an earthquake and like one shots my team. And it was a problem in ancient China. I've already experienced one before myself in real life and if I had to describe to anyone what it felt like, it felt like the ground was a waterbed. 
Some of you are probably not going to know what a waterbed is, but that's what it felt like. Well, it was so much of an issue that Zhang Hang made the groundbreaking invention of a seismometer, a device that can detect ground movement. It can't predict them, but it can tell you where they're coming from, using vibrations and tiny balls that would fall into frog-shaped cups depending on which direction it was coming from, something that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the compass from earlier. Hmm, interesting. Number 2. Beer. First tea, now beer? Oh, wait, no. First beer. The earliest recorded consumption of beer was in China 9,000 years ago. I could kiss these people. Two of my favorite beverages. That's it, I'm moving back in time to ancient China. Only, this beer wasn't exactly the same as the kind of beer we would think of made of barley. They used rice, hawthorn, honey, and grapes to make their beer. This 4 or 5% alcohol was mentioned in inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, so that would be 1600 BC to 1046 BC. But pottery from around 7000 BC contains traces of this same kind of alcohol. That's before even the Egyptian pharaohs. And three and a half to 4000 years before the Sumerians created the Western modern day interpretation of beer. The liquid was known as Zhu in Chinese and is often used as a spiritual offering to the heavens and the earth or to ancestors. And you know what? It still is, baby. Number one, paper money. The Zhaozi currency was the first time in history we used paper money. The stacks, the wad, the dough, the shkarol, the Benjamins, the Bordens, dead presidents, and the bread. There's no greater feeling than walking into a mall with a wad of cash, is there? JC Penny, here I come. Well, we have ancient China to thank for that. Well, sort of. Coins and metal were still more common and used for hundreds of more years before we started printing. In reality, the paper makes more sense. Before printing, coins could have been manipulated into making doubles or counterfeit. There wasn't a press yet. But with paper, it could be issued certain identifiers and used for certain things. The problem with the JLZ money is that it wasn't backed by anything. So it did cause a little bit of uh, what my generation knows too much inflation. Number 10 Steel Cage Match, brother. Okay, so it's the early 1900s and you're living in a rapidly growing city. Towers are popping up everywhere, and that means that there's less space for you and your baby to play in. Only if there was a way my baby could get fresh air and sunshine. Meet the baby cage, yeah. A small metal cage with a tiny mattress for your baby. The said metal cage is suspended on your windowsill, making the baby spend multiple stories above ground level. This, this is just a great idea. The idea behind this terrible idea was that the babies need fresh air and sunshine. Providing them with such was thought to improve their immune system and make them healthier. Besides the fact that the only thing separating your baby from becoming the worst rainfall event of the month was a thin metal cage. This is a prime example of why every product should be thoroughly tested and thought about before selling. Eventually, these did fall out of fashion, but in reality this wasn't that long ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Number 9. Nuclear Time A lot happened in the 1900s. I mean, a lot. Couple wars here and there, the TV, the car. It was a busy century. A century full of discovery and invention. One such unusual invention was the radium dial. Watches and clocks that were painted with luminescent paint, making the numbers and dials glow in the dark. Trouble with this new invention was the paint being used wasn't exactly safe, as it was made from radium. For the Breaking Bad nerds at home, radium is a highly radioactive element, even more so than the legendary uranium. So when a factory of women eager to get to work were told that they were going to be painting watches with radioactive paint, do you think anyone asked for PPE? Truth be told, not everything was known about radium as it was only recently discovered. But what's so unusual is what factories told these women how to paint the watches. In order to give the brushes a fine tip, the women were instructed to use their lips to keep the brushes in perfect order, not knowing that day after day they were ingesting a very radioactive element. And in some sense of dark comedy, they sometimes had fun and painted their nails and on each other. I mean, it glowed in the dark. It was glow in the dark paint. It was new. It was cool. Over 50 women would become very sick from painting, and 12 sadly lost their lives. Number eight, I'm ready for my close up. Ladies, this one's for you. In this day and age with social media, loving your self image can be tough. There's tons of things that makeup companies and media do to make you want to be the people they want you to be. If you buy said product, of course. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need all that. You're gorgeous just the way you are, and lately, honey, you've been slaying it. However, this marketing manipulation isn't new, and in the past, most certainly wasn't very subtle. Introducing the Beauty Micrometer. 
the latest from How to Horrify People Daily. It was actually invented by the famed beautician Max Factor Sr. Hell of a name. This steel cagey device was placed over a poor woman's head to then mathematically calculate the flaws that would be adjusted using makeup products. Obviously, these are no longer around and for good reason. I, I, I don't even have a joke for that one. That's just weird. Number seven, gunpowder. Okay, sure, we all know what gunpowder is and what it does. After all, what's a soldier without his blam blam? A cowboy without his big iron, or a pirate ship without cannons? I'd argue those things are nothing without that. However, I'd like to think of a more peaceful use, and not just because YouTube sweats when I bring up pistols. I remember a long time ago where my father would get a bucket from the Shmome Depot. He'd fill it up with sand, and we'd walk to a secluded part of the suburban area and launch fireworks. Sometimes we'd launch them into the streets, but that depended on how much rye he had. Depends. At least there was a bucket. Safety first, right? Well, none of that would have been possible without the invention from China. Gunpowder was invented by Chinese alchemists in the 9th century. Originally, it was made by mixing elemental sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, potassium nitrate. The charcoal traditionally came from the willow tree, but grapevine, hazel, elder laurel, and pine cones have all been used in the process. Number six, deep drilling. The province of Sichuan in ancient China, yes, like the sauce, was landlocked and about 1,200 miles from the sea. Because of that, they ain't got no sea salt. So, in order to get salt, the ancient Chinese from around the 2nd century BC developed drilling technology to get brine from deep in the earth, which naturally forms from evaporation of ground saline water. Look at that, we're all learning today. Salt is obviously quite an important resource, but the boring and drilling technology only got better and better, resulting in more and more resources to be found, like natural gas, <laughs> which could be used as fuel. And in the 11th century, the Chinese had the technology to be able to drill those suckers up to 3,000 feet deep, which is pretty deep in case you did not know. Number five, silk. I, for one, was always too broke to afford silk, especially after fireworks. Those bad boys are super expensive. Silk was an important thing in ancient China for the main reason that they invented the process of harvesting silk and were keeping it an ancient Chinese secret. Now, when you have a stockpile of a very valuable raw material that nobody else can get their hands on, and you have a stockpile of the finished product of which is a quality of clothing no one else can match, well, you're gonna be quite wealthy. Well, I don't need to pitch this in the Shark Tank. It's time to start selling and trading, and that's just what China did. This was a very profitable trade, so it got its own road, or roads, the Silk Road wasn't just, just one. The people who were buying from China loved it so much they wanted their own instead of paying exuberant prices, but it took them a long time to figure out what the process actually was. They thought it grew on trees. Comes from Number four, acupuncture. Have you ever had acupuncture done? Have you ever had acupuncture done? I've not. Neither have I. Let us know in the comments. I want to know if it actually works. When I was looking up this topic, it was called pseudoscience and said that there was no actual scientific proof that it works. Whether it does or doesn't, the practice of acupuncture is ancient. We know this from a less ancient book called the Neijing that was written around 305 BC to 204 BC and was the earliest book of Chinese medicine we know of. It was also called the classic of internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. Who was the Yellow Emperor? Well, that would be Huang Di, whose period lasted from 2697 to 2597 BC. And this guy, this emperor, revolutionized the practice of acupuncture. So all of that was a very long, long-winded way of saying that acupuncture as a practice has been around for more than 4,722 years. Look, writing videos is hard, okay? Just give me a break. Number three, Wilson! Some of you may have been cool enough back in 1975 to own a pet rock. Some of you may have not. Looking back, it doesn't really make any sense. Sure, everyone needs something to keep them company. Tom Hanks would have never gotten off the island he was stranded on if it wasn't for Wilson. Imagine a world without Tom Hanks. I, for one, would not want to live in such a world. All jokes aside, the Pet Rock was a genius marketing campaign, very similar to the fidget spinner of recent years. It's proof that if you can get a fad trade rolling, you can sell anything. Now, who wants some of my bath water? Number two, chef's kiss. Okay, it's 1958. Times are good. Cars have cool fins on them. Elvis is on the radio, and most of my post-traumatic stress disorder has cleared up since the war was over. It's all great. Ah, yes, life is good. I can't wait to enjoy some modern cuisine. Well, let's see what's on the menu. I'll have to start with the frozen cheese salad. 
I'll have ham and banana hollandaise. And for dessert, I'll have the lime jello tuna pie. If that doesn't sound appetizing, I don't know what does. For some reason, halfway through the century, people just lost their taste buds. They were coming out with all kinds of disgusting foods. A lot of them are in low form for some strange reason. I think the grossest item that you can come across is a little invention called Hongar. Sounds like somebody from Skyrim, but nay good sir. Hongar is a mixture of honey and apple cider vinegar. It was thought to provide great health benefits. The only thing that would give me is a spot in front of the toilet refunding my breakfast. Ooh. Number one, Krümelauf. Germany was having a really hard time in World War II. The United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, France, and Russia too were all coming to give the mustache man a piece of their mind. Heavily outnumbered, it was time for a miracle. Time to see what top German scientists had up their sleeve. We have a rifle that can shoot around the corners. Isn't it wunderbar? Yeah, this thing is real. A curved barrel called a Krumlauf, used for shooting around tight spaces like corners and out of tank hatches. During the waning years of the war, Germany was coming up with all kinds of crazy inventions to turn the tide. But a rifle that can shoot around corners probably isn't the answer. As mentioned above, the world was coming and they needed a lot more than a fancy pants rifle to stop the allies. History tells us that this invention did not work as Mustache Man is no more. Yeah.